Okay, this is just uh, basically chapter, I think this is chapter five, though the previous cohorts, I think they did not update the book down book. This is chapter five, and uh, which definitely I will be talking on the workflow. So the, first, the chapter, first of all, it begins. Let me zoom in a little bit so that we can see. I think it's okay now. So the chapter, first of all, it starts out with a, a kind of motivator, motivation from Adley. He said that he it, it, it think that the workflow, it, he see workflow as one of his secret powers. One of the reasons that he has been able to accomplish so much is that he devotes a lot of his time in improving his uh, workflow. And the chapter, he really, Adley really encourages us that we, we should spend more time in improving our workflow because this is going to really speed up the process in which we can uh, develop our shiny app. So the learning objective for this chapter is kind of like it's broken down into three uh, different sections. So the first section we are going to see how to create an app, okay? How to make changes and also experimentally think quickly on the app then we stop the app, we go back to continue with creation of the app. Then the second section I will be looking at, what about if something should go wrong with our app? If something should go wrong, how do we fix it? So that is the second section, what we'll be looking at, how to, how to fix bug in our Shiny app. Then the last part in the book, in the, in the learning objective, what about in the case, in situation whereby we have a bug? and we cannot fix that bug. So how do we ask for help? So we are going to see how we can do a self-contained reprex because reprex is like a reproducible example that we can, we can create and we submit in the R Studio uh, community Stack Overflow or Slack, seeking from help from more experienced uh, Shiny uh, developer. So in this section here, in, about is mainly acts like a motivation question that why development workflow? Yeah, the section talk about uh, workflow allow you to, us to reduce the time between making a change and seeing the outcome. It also help us to, to, to fasten the iterative, that is a fasten our process in which we, we can use in creating uh, the shiny app. But in the chapter, it mainly focus on two, two key aspects of creating the Shiny app. The first one is has to do with the create, how to create the app. That is the first workflow in which the chapter talk about. The second section, it talk about making changes and experimenting with the result and seeing the changes are faster. So that is definitely the second section uh, of the chapter. So I don't know if, is in case there is any question, maybe you can just pause me at any point so that if there is anything so that I can uh, really expand further. So this section mainly is about how do we create the app? Mainly talk about how do we create the app? And it talk about in every shiny app that we create is going to start with these six lines of code whereby the first line is going to be the library where we call the Shiny app. We are going to have the UI, the server, and the Shiny app where we, are UI, where we have the UI and server, which we use in starting the app. But the, once we have our app.r ready, we don't, need to, we don't need to write all this line ourselves because our studio, it has a built-in code snippet whereby we can easily insert this app and in our R script, in our app.r file. So without much, without missing, let me share my R Studio so that we'll see how to easily create uh, this shiny app. No, I have several R Studio open, several, I'm working on several projects. You can, I believe you can see my house studio. Let me just quickly create a blank house script. Okay, so the first section the book talk about, we just type 
they shine it up. Sorry. We type the shiny app. Then if you put, we click on shift and tab, we are going to insert uh, the code snippets. That is the first part. Then the second option, we can also type the shiny, 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 shiny app. Once we type shiny app, you can see that there is a code snippet there already. So if you hit enter, it will still do the same thing. It's going to insert the snippet in our code. So I like, I delete. The second uh, workflow to create, if I come to this year, I click on year, I click on the new project. Yeah, I said, don't save. Okay, it's going to drop a drop down menu. Though my Zoom is running, it's going to, our studio is going to be slow now. So I click on new project, then you click on shiny application. Then you just give it a directory name, the name of the direct, you just name it and you click on create. So that is the second approach in which the book uh, showed us. The third approach in which I also discover is that if you come to file, you come to shiny web app, there is a shiny web app here. If you click on shiny web app, this one, it will give you two op different options. It will ask you, do you want to create a single app.r or do you want to create a multiple UI and server? This one, you can split the UI and server. You can separate them. If you click on the second option, you are going to separate both the UI and server. It's going to create a single file whereby in that file, you are going to have only the UI component. The second file is going to have the server component. So, but if you want a single app.r, you click the first option. But if you want to split it, you click uh, the second option. Then another, the third uh, workflow is that you can embed, you can embed this app. You can embed it in an R, in an R markdown file. Okay, so when you click on this, I think there is a shiny there. If you click on the shiny, okay, the shiny documents or shiny presentation. So you, it's left for you, but if you click on here, there is still a documentation in which we can read further on this. This one will be shiny documents. This one will be shiny presentation, I think. That is uh, that for the workflow. Let me go back to the book down book that I'm using. Okay, I think I have been able, I have covered everything here. We have talked, look at the workflow, how to create the Shiny app. So the next uh, section, the book talk about seeing your changes faster. In this section, Adley also have another quote. At most, you create a, a few apps a day, but you will run apps hundreds of times. So mastering development workflow is particularly important. So yeah, hardly kind of advise us that, and every time we are creating, creating our shiny app, we should always avoid, let me go back. He said we should always avoid, he said we should always avoid clicking on the run app. He said we should always avoid clicking the run app, but rather, he advised us to use the keyboard shortcuts. And the keyboard shortcut, if you are in, on window, you use Control plus Shift plus Enter to start the app. But if you are using the Mac, Mac system, I think you use Command Shift plus Enter to start the app. To start the app. He also, in the second section of the book, for you to see your changes, for you to see your changes, let me, I think I have an app here. If I highlight the app. Okay, so I press Control Shift Enter. It's going to start the app. Okay, it's going to start the app. But the second section in, in, in which the books talk about is that we can run this app in a local job. And when we are running the app in a local job is that we will make changes to the app we see those changes populate in real time. We see them to populate in real time. But for us to achieve that, 
for us to achieve that, we need to have another script called Shiny Run App. Okay, and in this Shiny Run App, there are some arguments in which the book talk about. We need to set up options. Shiny dot auto reload. We set it to true. We set option shiny dot auto reload true. Then we now run a new function. Shiny colon colon run app. This is we are calling shiny from within our namespace. We are calling a function using within our namespace. So, in order for this to work, in order for this to work, we need to start a local job. And how do we start a local job? How do we start a local job? If you check in your house studio, there will be a job tab. But if you do not have a job tab there, if you come to tools, come to tools, I think there will be a job there. You just click on show job, okay? If you go to tools tab, you click on show job, the job tab will appear here. So if you click on start, start local job, okay? Once you click on the start local job, yeah, it's going to ask you the script parts. So you're going to select the script we want to run is a shiny run. So I select that and I open it. It's going to ask us for the working directory. The working directory I'm working on is still this directory. So I leave it in that way. Then it's going to ask us to start uh, the local job. So I'll click on start. Okay, so it's showing listening. This is then for us to start that local job. For me to start the local job, I need to, I need to come back to my console. I will say R Studio, R Studio API, I call view. But before I call the view, I need to copy this URL. Okay, I need to copy this URL. Copy it and paste it here. Okay, then I click on enter. So when I click on enter, you can see the job is here, it's running. The, that is the script is running, but it's like it's showing blank. Let me be sure, let me click on the drop down here to be sure that I am on the, okay, I need to click on jobs here, background job. So the house studio, I should stop this. Be sure that it's showing. Okay, I'm in background job. I should restart the job again. Stop this. Stop this. Okay, restart the job. Start the job again. Okay, copy this. R Studio API is already here again. Make sure that the port name is correct. I start the job. You can see it's there. The job is working. Let's screw down. So one side, but for us to see it clearly, I can just copy that URL. It's showing listing. I copy that URL for us to see it clearly. Then I go to my browser. Let me share my browser, another browser. I go to my browser and I paste it here. Oh, what is this? Refresh. Can be rich. What? The job is running. Let's see, where is it? Machine. Are you seeing which screen are you seeing just now? Um, is it I'm the mask? The web page. So show me your Zoom page right now. Okay, I'm, I'm coming. Uh, what? Mastering Shiny. Uh, now you're back to our studio. Yes, I'm back to our studio, but I can see the job here. So let me just send it to my browser. I'm seeing the job here. Okay, it's showing here in my browser. I've just sent it to my browser. Let me, 
Let me check here. Yeah. You can see it there. Okay. So definitely once I send this, it's now in my browser. So that is the, I don't know if there is any question at this point. Um, everything looks good. Actually, one thing I was wondering about is you were showing us options, um, you know, shortcuts to create the Shiny app template, right? Or the outline. Um, yes, yes. There is one option where you could either just have it all in one file or separate the UI and the server into different files. Yes, yes, yes. Um, why would you separate them in a different files? Just because my workflow has always been to include them in one app.r. <laughs> yes, uh, I think you have to separate them into different files. You know, in some cases, your app can go as big as possible. Your app can go bigger. So in order for you to avoid a uh, complication, it's better you split the app. Uh, the, but that is kind of a, a like advanced topic. It's better you split the app where you have the UI separately, you have the server separately. But I think today there was a great conversation in Slack. I think that was from Tan, where I think he shared a new approach whereby you can, maybe they were asking like in terms of if you're having, you are doing your data wrangling, what is the best approach to go whereby he make a great suggestion from a blog from Emily Redera whereby she used, she did her data wrangling in a separate file. She now in an app.r file, she just source those files in an app. I think that is a great approach also. That is also, also another good approach, which I just learned that uh, today. But what I know is that we can also split it where you have UI, you also have the server component separate. But I, I just learned that today that you can, you can do your separate file where you do your data wrangling, then you now come back in your app.r file, you can just source those files directly and you, you proceed with your Shiny app. I think that is also a very good example. So let me proceed. If there is no question I should share, uh, I should share my book down again. So the book also talk about the disadvantage for the local job that I just talked about, that this process can become a very, uh, it's very easy for you to debug because you are running the app in the background. That is a separate process. You are making changes, but what about if you talk about if the app goes bigger and bigger, it becomes very difficult for you to debug. So it really warn us about that because if you look, but if you want to know more about the local job, I think there is a link here where you can get more information about uh, the local job. So this uh, section definitely is about uh, controlling uh, the view in our Shiny app. It's about controlling the view. And if you look at here, there is a small drop down menu. Let me show you the house studio so that you can see it. Uh, let me share my house studio. Okay. Let me share the house studio. Okay, so you can see it's definitely talk about how do we control the view. If you look at the house studio here, you can see that there is a drop down tab here. If I click this, the default is always run it in the window. When you run it in a window, a, a small browser will pop up in your house studio where you can see the outputs of your Shiny app. That is always the default in which the developer they set. It's always run in a window, but you can run in a viewer pane. If you are running in a viewer pane, the output is just like this one I did. It's going to pop up here in a viewer pane. You can also, and in the viewer pane, this one is very good for smaller app. But what about if you are running a bigger app, you can run it uh, in a run in an a external browser. So this one is very useful for if the app is very big. So if you run it in an external browser, so it's going to pop up in your web browser where you can see uh, everything clearly. So that is just basically that for the view. So that is just for the view. So now, because this section, I really learned, I really learned a lot from this section about uh, debugging. Because this one is not only specific to Shiny 
also in base R, you can also use this. It's not only specific to Shani, it's also useful for base R. First, uh, I think Arlie also talk about a kind of quote here. He says it's an eight line app. What could possibly go wrong? And he also said that, they, and he also referred to debugging as the process of systematically comparing your expectation to reality until you, you find the mismatch. So that is, is the process of what we, we have gotten our, we have created our app. We keep on experimenting on that app to look for areas whereby you might get an unexpected error. And how do we solve that problem? He says something will definitely go wrong, definitely, because it takes years of experience to write code that works uh, the first time. Because even I have been writing uh, code for the past uh, four and a half years. So for you to write code that will work uh, the first time means that you need to develop a lot of time because you have to practice. Because there is a saying that practice uh, really make it is what is going to make perfection. Because Hadley himself, he, do, he does not just wake up in one day and begin to write program. He has done this for over time, for over the years. So that is why it, he made this that it take a great time. So we need to practice in order for us to become a better uh, shiny developer. But specific focus to uh, the chapter also uh, mainly focus on three debugging challenges uh, that are specific uh, to shiny, which we'll see in the next uh, section. So the three debugging challenges, uh, first of all, we you get an unexpected error, which is the simplest. I will always return you a traceback. There will always be a traceback or a cause. You can call it a traceback or a call stack because the traceback it is going to show you the sequence of call that is led to that error in which you are. And how do you fix it? You can use uh, the interactive debugger. You can use the interactive debugger. In this case, you don't get any error. You don't get any error. Here you can use interactive debugger and also with your own investigative skills in order for you to solve uh, the issue. Then in the, the hardest part, the, the test part, which is the most difficult, everything is correct, but no updates. Here, the book kind of warns us that the, invest, the interactive debugger or investigative skill is not going to help us here because they, this one is beyond our own controls. In that case, we need to seek from help. And how do we seek from help? We need to do a good reprex, whereby we can submit into our studio community, Stack Overflow or the Slack channels for ex more experienced uh, shiny developer uh, to provide solutions. So that is what definitely what the chapter is looking at. So in the first uh, section, I don't know, in this section, we'll be looking at fixing error using the trace bar. And this Adley also said that in R, every error is always accompanied by a trace bar or call stack. We call it trace bar or call stack, which literally traces back through the sequence of calls that lead to the error. And the, the function are printed, are always printed in reverse order. So like this is an example of a trace back or a call start. You can see the first function, the first call we make, which is the first call is going to be at the bottom. From this call, this call call the second function, which is called two. The third function is called three. The fourth function is called four, which will eventually give us the error, which is the main that they are showing there as an example. So the book, also try to walk us through an example of reading a traceback. So it gave us some, some example. Here we have a function f, which call g of x. We have the second function, which is g, and g call h of x. And the third function call two times two. And when we call f of three, f of three gave us four, okay? So we also go down the F, the same function F call G of X, G call H of X, and H call X times two. But when we now call F of A, in, we are going to get 
this will generate an error. Why? If we call it, look at the trace back. If we look at the trace back, the trace back is going to show us the sequence of call, which leads to the error. Okay, and this sequence of call is going to show us in, in a reverse order. And Atlee also advised in the book that for us to read this sequence is better we flip the start. We, we should feel, flip the call start in which when we flip the start, this is the first call we, okay? This is the next call. This, this call calls this call, this call, G of X. And G of X called H of X, which gave us what an error. So I don't know if there is any question to this point. No, it's all clear to me. Okay, thank you. So let me proceed. So that is that. So for all that is specifically to the base R. So how do we do all this in Shiny? And the book kind of said that. You can't use traceback in Shiny because you can't run code while an app is running. You cannot run the code while the app is running. But what Shiny will do is that Shiny will send the traceback to our console. It will, it will push the traceback to the console. While what we are going to see, we will see the error message in the Shiny app. It will put the traceback to the console. So let's make sure my house studio so that we see an, a demo on this process using Shiny. I think I have an app.r, okay? So let me comment this one out. Then we are done with this. I should just comment this out. Comment this out. Then this is a trace back option, okay? I comment this out. Okay, so I like this. Then instead of me to click the run up, I use the keyboard control shift enter. Okay, I've not saved the script, sorry. I save it. I save it. Control shift enter is going to run the app. Okay, you can see what Shiny is doing. It's going to send the error message in our app. We'll see the error message error, non numeric argument to binary operator. Then it's going to send the, the trace back or the call stack to our console. You can see the trace back. It's going to send it to our console. This is the first function Shiny run app. So, what this one is doing, this one is starting the Shiny app. Okay, this is the second function, which is output dollar sign plot. This is what is rendering the plot. If you look at my server function, I have output dollar sign plot, render plot. Then that is where, because if you are looking at this, this is what we suspect this function. This is the main offending function because every other function here, every other function here, they are specific uh, to Shiny, to the reactive function call in Shiny. But we are seeing that this call is just showing us call 1, 82, 83, 96, 11 to 166. So there are some specific uh, uh, outputs that is not shown here in the trace bar. Because for us to see those, those Shiny did not show that, us that, because those are not related to Shiny. They are, only, they are not related to our error. They are, those are Shiny function. But for you to see all the sequence of call, there is an option here that I commented out. Okay? There is an option. You will set options. Shiny dot full stack trace equals to true. So if I run this, let me save it. If I run this, Control Shift Enter. It will show the sequence of uh, calls to the last. You can see that the, the, the trace back is different. It will show the sequence of call to the last call. 
But Shani is not showing us this because these are not specific to our own problem. They will show us those code. You can see all the core, even to 173. So those are all the, it will show you if you want to see all the core, sequence of core. So I comment this out again. I don't know, is there any question for the, for the trace back or call stack? Is there any question? You know this, we are trying to debug. We are trying to debug for error. We have seen trace back. Are there, is there any question before we go to the next, which is the, the browser? In yeah, so for this trace back here where you set the options. Um, Shiny, okay. Yeah, when would you use um, this version instead? Okay, we use that version if we want to see the sequence of call. That is from the beginning of the call to the last call. If you want to see everything, just the sequence. So that is when we use option shiny dot full stack trace equals to true. We set we always set it to true. So I will stop the app, then go back to my book down. So now in this book down, the book also advise for how do we interpret. It always encourages us to flip the stack. We should flip the stack. That is, this is now going to be the first star, the first call, which is starting the app when we flip it. Then this is the offending function. Then this, as I said earlier, these are the render. So we should forget about this, but this is the main function. Uh, we have to suspect, which is giving us uh, the error. So here, yeah, this part mainly talk about the three components to a shiny error stack. As I said earlier, the first call, the run app, this one is definitely, this one, what this one does is that it's starting the shiny app. The first call here is starting the shiny app. But if we source the, the app.r file, in our, in, our, in, our, in our, if we source the app.r file, the error message that we are going to get might be different. We might see something like this source, print shiny app object and run app. This, the error will be different if we source that script. So this is what we are going to get. But the second uh, part of the three of the call is that, some internal shiny code in charge of calling the reactive expression. That is output dollar sign plot is where the problem is. That is, is now referring us to this line, that this line is the offending function, which is causing the error, okay? Then the third one, this one is uh, according to, he said, uh, the, that code that you have written, like the render plot. If you look at the script, we have a render plot there that will render the plots, the output dollar sign plots. Then we'll app.r to start the app. So this one are just internal function in which we, we wrote. Okay, so now we have talked about uh, how, to, how to fix, how, how to check for errors, the, how to debug our shiny app using the trace back, we have seen trace back to detect error. So now how do we fix those error? Fixing error, here we are going to use, see how we, you can use uh, the interactive debugger to fix error. Here the only also say you have identified the error using trace back. I want to figure out what is causing it. Here there are two different approach in which they are advised. The first one, is the browser, using the browser function. And this one is very useful because it's not only, you can only use this for shiny, even in your normal R script, you can use it to debug, to know what is causing what. So, and this browser, we can also run this browser within the, by specifying an if condition. That is, if that condition is met, then it's R Studio will take you to your interactive environment. We'll see that in a moment. And the second aspect in which they talk about is you also inserting a breakpoint within your script. You also inserting a breakpoint. Let me share my shiny app again, the R Studio. So here we are looking at interactive uh, debugger. 
I have some scripts here in which I commented out. So let me uncomment them. Okay. You can see I have the UI section. I also have the browser section. I, within the server, I, I inserted in line 20, what, 112, I inserted this function called browser, okay? I inserted the browser function there. So just look at what is going to happen. When I like this, and I start there with my keyboard shortcut, control shift, enter. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. My job is still running, you can see. I'm still running it in my background, my background job. So let me change it to console. Okay. Control shift enter again. Yeah. You can see that a new environment appear in my house studio. Okay. That is a browser. It takes me to an interactive environment. You can see in line 112. There is an arrow here, okay? To show that I'm starting my browser from this point. Um, there is some tab here. This one is for me. If I am sure, I can next go to the next line. If I want to go to the next line, I'll just press next. If I want to step into the function to query that function, I can use this. If I want to continue, I can, if I want to step, go out of the interactive debugger, I can stop it. So what I'll do now, I'll just say next and watch, just watch, watch what is going to happen here. When I press next, it's going to step into the next line. It's going to execute that function and step into the next line. If I press next again, it executes, it step into the next line. If I am okay with that, but within here, if you have some certain inputs, you can just check for those inputs here, it will work. Is going to work. I can say head of empty cars that is in my. I can check for the head. You can see it there is working within my browser. Then if I do next again, everything is fine. Every I can everything is fine. That means I am out of the browser mode. And if you check my app here. My app has updated. There is no error message. But I didn't mean there was any error in this app. At that point, it will return the error here. So that I will know the line within my code that is causing the error. So that I can easily step out of the browser and go back to that line and fix uh, and fix that problem. Okay. So that is for browser. Let me stop the app so that we see how the breakpoints work also. It's similar to the browser. But the 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 browser can be inserted in any line in Shiny. Even in your house script, you can insert uh, the browser anywhere, but breakpoints is different. The breakpoints, you only insert breakpoint on specific LA functions. I discover it, and for the breakpoint to work, your scripts, you need to save your scripts. So let me stop this and comment out that browser. Okay, save this. Then I would in line 113, when I go to the left side, just at the side of the line, I can just click on it. It will insert a breakpoint. That is the one approach. But another approach is for you to come to debug, debug, and just click on toggle breakpoints. It will insert the breakpoints at that point. Or you use the keyboard shortcut, which is Shift plus F9. It's going to insert a breakpoint. So let's see what that breakpoint is doing. Control, shift, and enter. Oh, I have not highlighted, sorry. Control, shift, enter. You can see it's the same thing just like before. It also starts from this line where I inserted the breakpoints. It, it take us to our interactive environment. So I can just click on next if I'm satisfied. It's going to take me to the next line, click on next, 
And if everything is fine, then my app, if there is no error, my app, everything will be fine to just update. Is there any question about the browser and breakpoints? Okay. So I comment out the script, save it, and I bring back my book down. Okay, so we also look at useful interactive debugger commands. So we can also next press N if we want to go next step, enter the next step in the function. We can also leave press N, press C. This one will leave the debugger, continues the regular execution of the function. While we can also use Q, which will stop debugging, terminate the function and return to the global workspace. And that is that. So, so debugging, this one talk about debugging reactivity. And he said, this is the hardest problem to debug. We need other tools which are not introduced in this chapter. And he also advised we should use print debugging to show values. We also use message here. Though I, I inserted, I have some scripts here. I, what I was thinking, Ryan will be in our discussion today so that I'll be able to ask him some questions. Maybe you can highlight more on the debugging reactivity, maybe in the next uh, meetup. But I have some script on debugging reactivity using message. Using message is that you just using glue, we can insert a message. It will just pop the message to our console. But what the I leave what I saw in the chapter because this one is from the main book when I read the main book, but it was not clear to me. I was thinking maybe Ryan will be here today, he will be able to expand further so that this section will be clear. So maybe in the next week, if he joins, we'll raise this. Maybe he will, he will share more light on debugging reactivity. So I'll just go straight to the last uh, section, which is getting help using Reprex. And Reprex, the short call is just a uh, reproducible example. Because we have looked at development cycle, we have seen how to create app, make change and experiment uh, quickly. We also seen debug, what's gone wrong and how to fix it. What about if we, uh, we don't know how to fix our problem? In that case, we need to write a, a Reprex. And it says, if you can't debug the error, it is time to ask, for help at Shiny Community by creating a Reprex. And a Reprex is just some R code that works when you copy and paste it into the session. A good Reprex uh, should be simple as possible because we need to make our Reprex to be minimal as possible. That is, that is if you are looking at the Reprex, the beginning of the line, I need to see your packages if you look. Yeah, I need to see all the packages in which you, you, have, you, have called, you have made called, you have used function from. Then we need to see the data sets in which you are making reference to and also the, the code. And the data sets, the, the book also highlights that we should make our data set as simple as possible. Let me, because I want to use my house studio, my demo script to explain, uh, in depth about this part. We are through with this. So the next is Reprex. Yeah. Though the code is not style, I will explain that in a moment. I will explain. Okay, so the book kind of said that we should make everything all the the first, we should always start with the library. If there are any packages in which we have loaded, we must make sure we load those library at the beginning of the call. Then the data sets, we should make that data set as simple as possible. That is, we should go specific to the, uh, only, the, only the columns that are specific to the problems in which we are seeking help for. Because other developers that are going to assist us they are also very busy. So we need to make everything simple as possible because if you look at Jenny Brand talk uh, on, I, I look at her talk, she talk much because she is also the developer of the Reflex package. 
She talked more that we should always spend 80% of our time. If you want to do a good reflex, we should spend 80% of our time to do our reflex. I think it also highlighted in this chat book also that the more 80% 80, 80 of our time in which we are spending to do to work on our reflex, we might even discover the solution to the problem in which we are seeking help for. But he said, and the book also make reference that our code, we must also make sure that our code, we style our code using the style verse styler. But the reflex package, we also have, I discovered that the reflex package, we can also use uh, the reflex package to style our code. So in order for us to do a reflex, let me clear this. In order for us to do a reflex, I think my job is like my job is still running. So let me stop this job. Be sure. Okay. In order for us to do a reflex, in order for us to do a reflex, I will show three different approach in which we can use to do this reflex. Three different approach. So the first one, I will highlight this code. Copy it. Okay. I like the code and I copy it. Then here, instead of me, I don't want, I want to call the reflex package from my namespace. I'll just say reflex. Let me zoom in a little bit so that it will be bigger. I'll just say reflex is reflex. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I can choose the target venue. The target venue, uh, that I want to send this reflex to. It can either be Stack Overflow, it can be GitHub. If you want, let's say for now, we are sending this reflex to GitHub or, or Stack Overflow, let's say Stack Overflow. So I just say SO, okay. Advertise session info. Let's say I need to see the session info for this reflex I'm trying to create. I set it to true, it's always logical. What again? Style. I need. I want to use the tidyverse styler to style this code. You can see the code already in my script. It's not well styled. I style it. I set it to true. Okay. So if everything is fine, I'll just click on enter. It's rendering the reflex. Okay, so it's the reflex is here and it's on my clipboard. You can see the code that it is well styled. Okay, the session info is there. I can just open a new script, Control Shift N, and I paste it there. You can see it. The code is well styled using the study verse styler from the reflex package. The session info is there. I can just go to Stack Overflow and paste this there to seek for help. You can see the error message warning, error in main valid type list of arguments. So I can go there and seek for help that I'm running my Shiny app or our studio community. I paste this reflex there that I need help. So it will be easy for somebody to pick this code, rerun it, and it's going to get the same error because somebody must be able to reproduce your code and it must be able to arrive at the same error in which you are getting in order for them to be able to help you because that is the idea behind Reprex. Somebody must pick your code. So right now this Reprex is in my clipboard. So I want to show you another approach. First of all, I need, I need to clear this, I need to say reflex. Uh, I think it's clean, clean, reflex clean, to clean my clipboard so that everything will go. So the second approach in which we can do this reflex. But before we go in there, I need to style the code using the style verse styler. I will highlight this. 
okay? I'll just use keyboard shortcut to assess my, or let me go in this. Because already you, I can use control shift, control shift P to assess my adding. So what I'm looking for is a styler, styler selection. Are you with me? So I'll just click style selection. It's going to style that highlighted code. So let's see. You can see it have styled the code. You can see the code is styled now. So the next thing for me to do, I, yeah, I'll use the keyboard shortcut Control Shift P to assess my adding. There are two options for the reflex. Either I choose render reflex or a reflex selection. So let's start with the reflex selection first. Reflex selection is rendering the reflex. So he said reflex output is on the clipboard. So the output is already on my clipboard. I'll just open an R script, Control Shift N, and I paste it there. This is the reflex that I create. The same reflex, okay? So I clear this. I go back to the app.r. I light it again. The second approach, the third approach, I mean. Control Shift P, which is the render reflex. I click on render reflex. So this one will open a shiny interface. So the render reflex current selection. So I'll click on current selection, uh, the target venue. I can say, in this case, let's say Slack. I can I select Slack, append session info. I can just say, yes, I want to append. Then I render the reflex. It's rendering the reflex. It's rendering it. So that's it again, sorry. Current selection. Target venue, I say Slack. Append it. Render the reflex. It's rendering the reflex. Yeah. So the reflex output is, is still on the clipboard. I'll just come to that same script and I paste it. It's the same reflex. It's the same reflex. I don't know if there is any question before I go to the summary. Nope, no questions. Okay. So let me just uh, go back to the beginning of this section. Uh, yeah. So, so, so far we have been able to, we have seen how to create uh, like a rip cap. We have seen how to create uh, the shiny app, make changes and experiment uh, quickly. That is truly our development workflow, how to speed up the process of creating app, making changes, experimenting on the changes quickly. We are also seeing how to debug Shiny app using the traceback, uh, using the interactive uh, debugger, which we can use to fix issues when we have issues in order for us to solve it. Uh, and also we are, if we cannot fix our issues, we can go and look for help. And before we can go to look for help, we need to do our reflex and we can make, we should make our reflex as simple as possible and clear because other developers in which we are seeking help from, 
They are very busy, so we need to make everything to be simple. We should reduce everything to the minimum. That is only to those specific issues that we want to seek help for, not that we just push all our code out there for somebody to look for a solution for us. So we should make it as simple as possible. I think that is the summary of my talk. I don't know if there are any issues, any question. Nope, that was great. Um, I appreciated that you walked through examples in our studio for everything. So it's very clear, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So I think I will see next week, guys, till next week. I think Ryan will take us on the HTML aspect. That will be till next week. Okay, okay. that sounds good. All right, see you next week. Okay.